of Friends. I am Camille Nelson, and I am the Dean of the William S. Richardson School of Law, and it is my great honor to welcome you today to our celebration of the International Day of Peace and Constitution Day. We have a terrific conversation, really, with wonderful panelists today as we share with you some thoughts on reimagining economies in Hawaii. I think this particular conversation is incredibly timely as we face constitutional discord, war in a number of places in the world, front of mind issues around climate justice, supply chain issues, many, many things that relate to food insecurity, growing houselessness, certainly issues of economic and wealth disparities that have persisted, and forced migration. There was an article recently that I saw um, on the weekend that was speaking to the reality of increased migration, immigration to Canada as a climate destination. These are conversations that are ripe and perhaps well overdue. And certainly for those of us who love this place, this is a particular opportunity for us to engage some of the most brilliant minds and thinkers on this subject. So I very much look forward to this conversation and I thank you all for joining us for this panel today. And with that, please allow me to turn it over to my friend and colleague, Maya Satoro. Thank you and welcome. Mahalo, Dean Nelson. So grateful for your leadership, your presence here today, and um, your thoughtful expressions of community. Um, Welcome everyone, so good to see you. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Maya Sutoro. I'm a peace educator and a specialist at the Matsunaga Institute for Peace and Conflict Resolution. Uh, first, of course, let us acknowledge Hawaii as an indigenous place uh, of the Kanaka Maoli. The Aina on which I sit is located in the Ahupua'a Waikiki on the Mokupuni of Oahu. I recognize that Her Majesty Queen Liliuokalani yielded the Hawaiian Kingdom and these territories under protest to the United States to avoid the bloodshed of her people and recognize that generations of Kanaka and their knowledge systems have shaped Hawaii in a way that allows so many of us to gratefully enjoy her gifts today. So, Thank you for being here with us. I'm delighted that we're going to hear some ideas for building a regenerative economy wherein communities are seen as the heart of decision-making and trusted leadership collaborating uh, with community can address challenges and co-create solutions holistically. Um, regenerative economies ask us to reconsider ways to care for and replenish um, ecosystems and uh, develop innovative concepts of livelihood and opportunities that allow residents and especially young people to grow and realize their fullest potential. Here in Hawaii, that means that sustainable local food and circular economies um, should be grown uh, to ensure communities are not dependent on imports. It means housing and entrepreneurial opportunities should be lifted up. Uh, the public health and um, non-extractive hospitality solutions uh, can be implemented. Um, we have excellent models of sustainability here. And decision making and leadership organization uh, for uh, the people of Hawaii can um, be used to inspire many others. Think of the Ahupua'a, um, you know, the land divisions that we have from Mauka to Mukai, from mountain to ocean. Uh, what we now call regenerative agricultural practices have been at the heart of indigenous food, culture, and community well-being. So today we can explore putting ethical regenerative practices as the foundation of our economy and our community, but also we can think about how to bridge um, ideas present here and elsewhere. Uh, we should, of course, 
this being Constitution Day, consider the public policy that embeds these practices um, and the advocacy for uh, appropriate legal infrastructure to sustain them. And we can think about a variety of ways to prioritize and support the work that gives back to and reinvigorates um, one another. As one of the panelists noted a shared culture of aloha and responsibility of kuleana connect Hawaii's people and together we can guide action in Hawaii and inspire communities worldwide to unlock their deepest uh, and best values. So I'm excited now to jump in the conversation. I'll ask each panelist to give a two to three sentence bio, um, their definition of regenerative economy, and, and then I'll ask another question that allows them to share their particular assets, contributions, and perspectives. But there will be time for audience questions after we have heard from all of the panelists. So please note your questions in the Q&A. All right, mahalo. So first I'd like to call upon Uilani Tanigawa Lam. Uh, Ui, can you share with us your definition of regenerative economy and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, aloha, aloha kako and mahalo e maya for um, that beautiful introduction and for having me here today. Uh, my name is Ui Tanigawa Lam and I am a kupa of Makoao Maui. Um, I'm an attorney and a fellow at Kahuliao Center for Excellence in Native Hawaiian Law, um, which is housed within the law school. And aside from that, I am a mother, I am a hula practitioner, and I have a background in Hawaiian studies. So I'm so grateful to be here. I think generally speaking, our, our regenerative economy is about considering and integrating all aspects of life. Uh, from humans to Aina, as well as the Pilina or the relationships, both um, political, familial, social, and all these, these Pilina that bind us all here in Hawaii. Um, and, and I'm excited to dive in a little bit more and think a little bit more about what this means for us here in Hawaii today. Mahalo, thank you so much. And so I'd like to ask you to share what Kanaka Maoli beliefs and practices are crucial for us to learn from and be inspired by to allow for self-determination and regeneration. And you know, how does our existing legal framework support and or hinder um, the implementation and reverence uh, uh, and utility of these beliefs, you know? Right, right. Mahalo. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind when we're talking about regenerative economies, um, for me, is recentering Indigenous practices to guide us forward, to guide our decision making. And um, one particular value specifically, I think about, it's very foundational, um, this value of aloha aina. And I think this concept of aloha aina often gets reduced to sort of two simple meanings of love for land and maybe patriotism or activism. Um, but I, I want to acknowledge that these meanings are insufficient, right, to capture the, the entire nuances around aloha aina as, as both a philosophy for Kanaka Maoli as well as a cultural mandate. Um, and we can have an entire panel or even a semester course about the various aspects of aloha aina. But for me, it starts with aina at the center, right? Um, not just as a piece of land, but as our natural counterpart and as an ancestor. Um, I think of, for example, the kumulipo, which is just one cosmogonic articulation of our origins as a people and as kanaka. Um, and it articulates that Aina and Kanaka share the same Mo'oku Auhau or genealogy. And the short version of this Mo'olelo is that the firstborn child um, was stillborn and that child was buried in and became Aina and from that place grew Kalo. And the second born child was the first human from which all Kanaka um, were born. And according to this Mo'olelo of creation, humans are the youngest of all living things in this world. And so for Kanaka Maoli, um, and this positionality particularly gives, gives rise to a duty or a kuleana to aloha aina. So I think for Kanaka, um, aloha aina is both an active practice and a central and orienting framework for Kanaka, um, one that, that guides decision-making and resource management, and something that I think is an incredible resource to us all as we, as we reimagine the economies that we live in. 
um, as a cultural precept and what's being developed and articulated as a present day legal duty, Aloha Aina can, I think, and must um, get, guide and our decision making and our law and policy around these conversations. But that first starts with, I think, recognizing our positionality, um, the kuleana that arise from those relationships, and then how to prioritize these things in decision making and lawmaking. And there, there are some helpful frameworks that we have to, to be able to do those things. Um, and that's because for centuries, Hawaii's, as you mentioned, Maya, Hawaii's cultural practices and beliefs have sustained life on our islands in the middle of the Pacific. And in fact, in terms of Hawaii's particular legal framework and constitution, um, well, Hawaii's laws are unique. And that's because Hawaiian custom and traditions of this place form the bedrock or the foundation for our laws. Um, and again, we could have a whole nother panel on this, uh, but in a nutshell, as a result of the 1978 CONCON or Constitutional Convention, and really out of a concern for Hawaii's um, natural and cultural resources, Hawaii's people elevated resource and customs protection to a constitutional mandate. Um, so we have really strong constitutional protections around natural and cultural resource management. Um, for example, briefly, Article 12, Section 7 protects traditional and customary practices, and Article 11, Section 1 imposes a duty to conserve and protect our natural resources for the benefit of present and future generations. Um, so whereas we may be looking at the U.S. Constitution as sort of a barrier, um, I think in Hawaii, our legal framework actually supports and um, inspires these conversations we're having around reimagining what's possible. So. Um, for me, a really ripe ground or a really ripe, ripe aina, if you will, for, for change and reimagining what's possible. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, I wanted to, um, before we close our time with you for now, ask you to tell us a little bit about your work with the legal clinics to secure water for the Kalo farmers in um, Waioli, um, the Kalo, the Taro farmers, for those of you uh, from here. Sure, sure. Mahalo, Maya. I had the privilege of working with these small Ohana farmers um, of the Waioli Valley Terahui, and they're located on the North Shore of Kauai. And, um, after record-breaking flooding in 2018 as a result of a rain bomb, um, they received nearly 50 inches of rain in a 24-hour time period, and that completely devastated both their Lo'i Kalo as well as a small town um, that they support. And so in, in disaster recovery relief efforts, they're informed that the land that they had stewarded for centuries um, was now state conservation land, which triggered a maze of legal permitting and other uh, requirements. So our research in helping them to recover, um, uncover that they had been using largely the same system in the same place um, and manner and largely with the same ohana since the 1500s. So it was a lot of work, but um, that the example of the, the Waioli Valley Terahui is a shiny example of the possibilities um, when we center indigenous knowledge and practices that have been honed in specific places by specific people for generations. Um, there are a number of things I'd love to highlight about these folks. Um, they're so dear to my heart, but I, I'll just briefly say this idea of Kalana, um, our work focused on a traditional land division that was more related to the identity of the community rather than governance. Um, so again, guided by P, the Pilina and relationships between Aina and Kanaka. And so the, the who we advocated for in the Water Commission uh, recognized this place as a Kalana um, and the way that it was traditionally and comprehensively managed for generations. Uh, we, they also underwent chapter 343 processes, which is meant to evaluate the negative impacts of a project or impacts generally of a project on um, Aina. And we struggled with this in crafting our environmental assessment because they didn't fit into the box. And the research actually showed that they had significant environmental benefits to both um, the Aina, the environment, as well as the social fabric of the place. Um, and they were recognized as the first co-managed um, terrestrial resource. And then after three years of participating in legislative sessions, the farmers were a part of passing Act 27, which exempted them uh, 
Kahlo farmers who cultivated Kahlo in a traditional and customary manner from the water leasing process. Um, so for me, to wrap it all up, um, the big takeaways are the fact that the Hui sort of recentered traditional principles and practices of resource management um, and cultural knowledge, and then even traditional food systems and economies. And their work also tackled and perhaps removed some artificial barriers to actualizing their constitutionally protected practices and, and really benefits to Aina in their community. It's such a powerful example and a multifaceted one. I really appreciate that, you know, you're bringing together considerations of community, peace, justice, environment, um, as, as we are doing today, as, as well as uh, um, economics. And um, it it um, is such a wonderful example of um, kind of how we can formally organize for food sovereignty and public health and and uh, uh, climate activism. So um, thank Mahalo for, for sharing that and for being here today. And uh, next, I'd love to invite um, uh, Kamana Bina, Bima. Kamana, would you please share with us, what is your definition of a regenerative economy? What does that look like to you? Sure. Velina Mike, Elohi Kaina, Kako, Pakahia Pau, Uau, O Kamana Mai Kalani Beamer, No Kapu Wai Mea, Uau, Hivahi Kaua, No Ke Elohi Kaina, Aloha Mai. I'm Kamana Beamer, and I'm, thank you, Maya, for this incredible opportunity. Mahalo to the sponsors and such an important time to be here to think about peace and justice um, on this day. And the economic system is, is something that absolutely needs to be remedied if we are to have peace and justice um, in our islands and across the world for our people, for our environment, and um, all the species that, that live here. So um, I think of a regenerative economy as, as something that really mimics, mimics the natural cycles of, of nature. You know, we've, we've maintain life uh, on our planet for millennia, um, mostly because there really is no waste. Um, you know, the leaves that fall from the trees become soil. Um, our, our bodies 200 years from now return to soil and, um, and feed future trees. <laughs> and that's really how, um, you know, nature works um, on our planet. And so a regenerative economy is really about something that, that adds back. Um, that gives back to a new system, a new cycle. Um, and and it's, we should also understand that really as being in response to, you know, the economy that we all know of today, which is really the linear economy. It's really one that's focused on, you know, extraction and um, oftentimes at the expense of degradation of resources, where we take, we make and manufacture a product and that product is, is ultimately becomes waste and, and ends up in the landfill. And um, throughout this system, we have extreme exploitations of, of the environment and people and labor and bodies um, where, you know, most of the profits that are made in a linear economy go up to the 1% and create vast social economic inequalities um, while plundering, you know, our natural environments. And, and this is an incredible time because uh, our entire planet is really rethinking the ways the economy can function and, and redesigning it. So mahalo for this chance and opportunity, Maya. Yeah, mahalo to you for all of your work. Um, can you please share with us some of your efforts to reimagine the economy in Hawaii is, and um, especially in, in recent years? And um, what have you learned about how we best transform our economy into a non-extractive, non-colonial form of labor and use the amazing strengths and assets we have to, uh, to build a, um, a more just and verdant future? Sure. Um, you know, I, I think the first thing that I want to discuss um, you know, and what I've learned and, and what I've seen is just the incredible courage of people in our community um, to, to call out and, and to demand justice uh, here in Hawaii and all around the world. And, um, and, I, and I think it really starts with that, is, is courage. Um, you know, we need to be courageous and call out the extractive, exploitative, uh, destructive systems that um, are plundering our, our planet and our natural environments locally. Uh, for instance, a big one here in Hawaii is, is the Red Hill, you know, and, and the aquifer. Um, 
Whereas just, you know, 20 years ago, there's this real celebration of, of militarism and, you know, the military's impact on our economy. Um, and, and, you know, now we see um, it's at the expense of our most precious and natural resource on Oahu. And, and now the entire island is having to sort of um, convene and, and, and figure out a future together. Um, so a big part of achieving a regenerative economy is, is justice and, and courage to call out the destructive systems that we see around us. Um, the second thing I want to say is, um, you know, that linear economy has mostly produced these Alice statistics, you know, um, people who are fully employed, working their tails off, they can barely afford rent, need multiple jobs. Um, and so we really have to think about equity in, in our economic systems. You know, here in Hawaii, we have an incredible philosophy, a way of life, worldview that Ui explained around Aloha Aina, you know, and a lot of my work um, really has been informed by our ancestral systems. Um, you know, I'm engaging in, in publications. Uh, just later this week, I'll be in, in an international conference on circular economies in Vienna. Um, so our ancestral systems are, are really what, you know, we could use to build off of. Um, and that's some of my work as a professor. As a community member, we formed Ainaloha Economic Futures. Um, if you go to uh, ainalohafutures.com, you can learn more about our work. It really was this this uplift, this moment um, in the midst of COVID where a number of us got together and said, hey, you know, in the midst of this pause, maybe maybe we can rebuild a little better, <laughs> better for our aina, better for our people, better for our community. And um, and we really work to uplift the incredible innovation that's happening all around our islands, you know, places that we talked about, go to Waipa Foundation, go to Paipaio Heia, go to Kako'o Iwi. Um, Puanui here on Hawaii Island and see, you know, this innovation um, that's happening in our community where um, we're providing jobs, education. Um, the regenerative economy is really about the multiple returns that come out of the economic system. You know, there's a whole set of policies and, and social structures that um, we've sort of accepted um, that, that have been damaging our planet and we really need to rethink these values in ways that are more in line with our kupuna. Um, and so um, there's a whole bunch of work. You can go to our website, ainolohaeconomicfutures.com. Um, my personal academic website, if you go to kamanabeamer.com, you can see some of the publications and activities that we're involved in. And, um, you know, we're, we're committed to justice and equity um, for Aina and our people in the future. And um, it's been a long line for Kanaka Maoli. Um, to achieve this, we're not the first, and 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 we won't be the last. But um, now is the time um, to to really push forward. So mahalo, Maya. Mahalo, and I have been so impressed with the Ainaloha Economic Futures process of bringing together, especially frontline community source solutions, making sure that those people who have suffered and struggled and have kind of moved through the storm are really able to share and present their ideas and um, and their expertise is recognized. So there's a sense of recognition that comes from it, um, the, the, the process and lots of good ideas, but um, um, really appreciate the collaborative uh, format and the uh, real commitment to um, sustaining uh, that practice. Uh, so mahalo for that. Everyone go go check it out if you haven't already. And now I'd oh, I keep muting myself, sorry. <laughs> now I'd like to invite Derek um, Kawanoi to uh, come and share um, some thoughts with us. Mahalo. Mahalo. Um, Maya, thank you for the opportunity. And I, I also want to thank you for... Um, your land acknowledgement. Uh, I, I uh, admittedly, I've uh, uh, so I am a assistant professor of law at the William S. Richardson School of Law. I've just recently returned home after five years in Tucson, Arizona, um, and during my time there, I've I've heard a lot of different uh, land acknowledgements, uh, both there and also in Canada, and I had never heard one uh, quite like yours uh, with regards to uh, with regards to Hawaii. So I uh, really. I, I really appreciate that. Uh, my interest is in my, my general research interests uh, kind of focus on international human rights and, and indigenous peoples. Um, 
with regards to a regenerative economy, I'm not sure that I can like add substantively to what uh, Kamara just described as a regenerative economy or regenerative economies. Uh, I do want to say uh, I strongly encourage uh, viewers to check out his website and uh, any publications that they're able to get their hands on. Um, having been away for five years and then hearing from friends and colleagues, you know, during the earlier part of the pandemic, uh, and then during that period, hearing from them, their concerns about the economy of Hawaii. And, you know, maybe we've been focusing a lot more uh, on tourism than we should. Um, what are the ways that we can, you know, better, how, how can we have a better economy that better manages our resources and, uh, as Kamana said, uh, is less extractive and less exploitative. And so for me, when I think about uh, regenerative economies, even though it's a broader concept that has application uh, more broadly and in other places, uh, for me, I'm, I'm really focused and uh, very interested with about it in a Native Hawaiian context um, and then in a context of how uh, that is a part of indigenous self-determination and, uh, and self-governance. Thank you, mahalo, Derek. And can you share with us uh, the connections uh, between our discussion of regenerative economies in Hawaii and your uh, particular um, interest in indigenous self-determination and self-governance? Can you talk to us a little more about uh, how that plays uh, out and, and kind of braid those concepts uh, for us a bit better? Sure, uh, or at least I'll try. Um, you know, over you know many decades, the struggle of for indigenous peoples to uh, be recognized and to have their rights protected and their cultural practices respected, it's been a long struggle, um, and it continues to be a struggle. And I think when we consider some of the issues that have happened in Hawaii in recent times, we can see how that struggle continues uh, more locally. Uh, but what we're also starting to see is a very slow and gradual recognition of indigenous people's rights and the need to protect their cultural practices uh, over the long term. And with that, we're starting to see in different countries uh, efforts. Again, they're not fast enough and um, not implemented uh, quickly enough, but we are seeing we are seeing a trend where countries are recognizing the importance of protecting indigenous peoples and making sure that they have an opportunity to exercise greater self-determination and self-governance uh, over their own communities, including their land uh, and cultural resources. And as Ui mentioned earlier, you know, in the 1970s, uh, primarily through the uh, Constitutional Convention, you started to see uh, amendments to the Constitution that provided for greater environmental protections than were provided previously, and then also a recognition of the need to protect Native Hawaiian traditional and customary uh, practices. Kind of more globally, when we take a look back and examine some of the decisions or uh, answers that international human rights uh, bodies have made or recognized, there is a recognition that indigenous peoples have a human right to property. And within that understanding, there is also a recognition that even if indigenous peoples are not recognized as owning land or other resources and fee simple, just the fact that for generations, if not thousands of years, these pre-existing societies, ex indigenous communities that pre-existed uh, colonial governments and uh, the development of nation states either around them or encroaching on them. The fact that they accessed and used these lands and resources means that they've got customary rights. And so when decisions are being made with regards to these lands, there is a growing recognition that indigenous people um, should be given a free prior and informed consent or that nation states and corporations working with the consent of nation states pursue indigenous people's free prior and informed consent when doing things to land that could impact their ability to utilize those natural and cultural resources. Uh, the way we see that kind of work out in the United States is a, is a little bit unique, um, but we see you know, through various ways that there are 
consultation practices, consultation not necessarily being the same as consent, uh, but consultation uh, as one step in a long process of pursuing Indigenous peoples' uh, free prior and informed consent. And so when we think about the holistic approach of regenerative economies, the importance of Indigenous wisdom for purposes of sustainability and managing our land and uh, cultural resources, uh, I think that international human rights is one source uh, that we can look to to kind of better facilitate that and then trying to find out or, or advocate internationally to impact uh, domestic law and policy with regards to indigenous self-determinants to self-governance thank you thank you so much thank you for uh that explanation and perspective and guidance and and i think that um moves us beautifully into um a introducing our next speaker, uh, Jeff um, Gilbreth. Jeff, am I pronouncing your last name correctly? That's correct. Thank you, Mahalo. Um, of uh, Hawaii Community Lending. Um, uh, Jeff, would you first uh, share with us your vision or um, definition of regenerative economies and uh, a little bit of background um, about you and your work? Sure. Uh, Mahalo, Maya. Um, it's an honor to be on the panel with such distinguished, uh, distinguished panelists, and um, and happy to be here with the participants that are listening. And I think the perspective that uh, I bring and my counterpart Chelsea Evans brings is really uh, what's happening on the ground day to day for families as they're trying to interact with this this system, uh, which I think one of the panelists had shared is currently um, uh, extremely extractive. And, and I bring us to a vision that our two organizations have developed, um, which is really specific to that, uh, to the families we work with, the community members that are part of uh, the work we do. And the vision is really around the idea that all Native Hawaiians will own a home and reconnect to Aina for spirituality, food security, uh, economic self-sufficiency, and the healing of generational trauma from the systemic uh, separation of Hawaiian people from Hawaiian ancestral lands. And, and we believe as, as organizations and families and family members that make up our organizations, that when we realize this vision together, our ohana will anchor a 21st century Hawaiian economy that's centered on Hawaiian values, equity, and collective well being throughout our diverse and inclusive communities. So that's really the, the lens that we take Maya um, uh, as it relates to a regenerative economy. Thank you so much, Jeff. And um, I would love for you to, um, I guess, share with us a little more about uh, Hawaii Community Lend Lending's current role uh, alongside Hawaii Community Assets, and we'll hear from, from Chelsea um, next, but about what law and policy changes you think could be made to support a Native-centered regenerative economy at this time? Uh, sure. I mean, I, I think I can speak to the fact that um, the work we do uh, at Hawaii Community Lending is as a Native Community Development Financial Institution. So we are the result of federal policy uh, that set aside a certification process for community loan funds um, that are controlled by Native Hawaiian community or Alaska Native and Native American community. Um, and to have an earmark of federal dollars so that as institutions, we can make sure that there's access to credit and capital um, in native communities that oftentimes um, uh, have been invested in. Um, uh, we can look um, simply to the fact that Department of Hawaiian and Homelands received a, a historic investment in, um, in Hawaiian homelands and in, in developing Hawaiian homelands in this last legislative year, but I think we have to call the question what happened 100 years prior to that. The decades long uh, disinvestment in Native Hawaiian communities. And so uh, in the work we do, we are really the result of that federal policy that allows for this. Uh, it was passed in 1994 
uh, to allow for the creation of these self-regulated financial institutions. And we see um, institutions like ours across the nation um, whereby we're using our capital to be able to help families, yes, purchase homes, um, engage in the economy in a way where they can bring their values and, and practices and, and traditions forward, um, that they can um, uh, uh, push back against an extractive economy, um, but also start to buy the land back, to be honest. Um, and, and so in terms of what we see at the federal level and the recognition that we see uh, for institutions like ours, um, uh, we are a form right now uh, of, of economic sovereignty, um, but I would be remiss if, if I wouldn't echo what Derek had been mentioning, which is um, there's a critical need um, for Native Hawaiian community to be recognized um, as a sovereign people at the, at the federal level, um, I think he, even at the state level. Um, but in our own communities, we have to, we have to realize and recognize uh, the truth of this place. And frankly, the, the, the pain the Hawaiian community has had to endure for so long and the responsibility of non-Kanaka like myself um, to understand as best we can that pain and understand as best we can the need for the changes in these policies for recognition at the federal and state level to allow for um, not just small nonprofit CDFIs, but the combining of uh, financial assets amongst all the Native Hawaiian trusts uh, and, and our financial assets into a single sovereign entity that can, um, uh, can do so much more in pushing forward on a regenerative economy. And so, you know, it's, it, it's great to be on this panel with, with all these folks. I, uh, I do feel a bit inadequate in light of the fact that, you know, uh, don't carry uh, a law degree by any means, but um, what we do carry at Hawaii Community Lending is um, just an understanding um, that we are seeing under this current framework, um, promising practices that are moving, that could be the stepping stone um, to a more sovereign space um, and control by Native Hawaiian community as it relates uh, to land, uh, to the economy. And, and very clearly the families we're working with are on the front lines of moving a regenerative, moving toward a regenerative economy. And so when we think about assets, we, we don't just think financial, we think most importantly, the families, the Ohana, um, that are the greatest assets we have, you know. So just really appreciate the time, Maya. Um, and I don't know if there's any additional questions, but. I hope that was helpful. Yes, very much. Uh, so, um, Jeff, thank you, and and looking forward now to hearing from your your partner Chelsea. And you know, thank you for all of you panelists for staying here. And just a reminder to those of you who are in attendance today that uh, we are we are leaving space at the end after hearing from all the panelists to ensure that if you do have any questions for them um, that I have not asked that there's opportunity uh, for, for us to get to your questions. So please put the questions in the Q&A. But now, um, Chelsea, um, I'd love for you to uh, share with us a little bit about yourself and your definition of regenerative economies. This is Chelsea okay. Evans, aloha from Hawaii Community Asset. Hawaii. <laughs> How are you doing? Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Um, okay, I would be the one with the technical difficulties of my video. Hi. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you so much for having me. My name is Chelsea Evans. I'm born and raised on the island of Maui up in Makawao um, and now residing in Honolulu on Oahu. I'm the um, current executive director with um, Hawaiian Community Assets and have been here since December. Um, a little bit about, about um, 
I guess just kind of my thoughts. The, the panelists here have such amazing um, thoughts on regenerative economies, and I don't know if I necessarily have value to add. So as they were speaking, I was having these moments of these, um, I guess, just um, thoughts that made me smile of what regenerative, um, regenerating spirit to our Kanaka would be in, in, a, in an economy on here. And that seems to make more sense to me. So um, maybe some of the things that I can share of some of the thoughts that popped up was um, maybe the thought of like, when a Hawaiian opens a convenience store that they have enough Aina back support and enough access to capital. Um, the corporate Walmart actually has to do a reevaluation of whether or not they can thrive here in Hawaii anymore. Um, I think about every time a food truck opens that the worth of a Chick-fil-A would go down. Um, I've been thinking about the systems that our clients sometimes have to go through when they want to become small business owners here in Hawaii and how it actually is one of the most difficult systems to be able to stay in compliance with in the country and how a change like that could actually lead to regeneration of spirit and thriving in Hawaii. Um, and I think maybe if we could start seeing a change in um, maybe a change in some of the statistics of whether or not your ancestors were Kanaka or colonizers, determining whether or not you can actually stay and thrive here in Hawaii. Um, I think those are some of the few things that, that came to mind as, as these panelists were speaking earlier. Mahalo. Uh, I uh, look forward to going to that food truck and convenience store. Um, can you tell us more now about uh, Hawaiian community assets work and um, specific efforts to prepare Kanaka for home ownership uh, and um, other uh, empowering um, efforts uh, as an example of an organization that's actively helping to build a regenerative economy. We'd, we'd love to learn more. Yeah, sure. Um, so HCA was started really um, because of the issues in the system of, of DHHL, um, somewhat of what, what Jeff had talked about. Um, our two founders um, were waiting on the DHHL wait list for a really long time, and they got that letter in the mail um, to be able to show up to a school cafeteria, bring their documents with them, um, that their name had finally come to the top of that long wait list. Um, and they were very excited to be able to, to get their piece of land. Um, and as they waited in that, that cafeteria for their name to be called, you know, they approached the table, they bought all of the documents that were asked. And within minutes, they were told that they did not qualify due to credit history and other personal items. And they walked out of that cafeteria and had a discussion kind of in the parking lot that, that really was the start of HCA. Um, that was really about how did we end up here? How did we not know that our credit needed to be worked on? How do, you know, how do we not even know really what credit is and how we deal with that and what we should have done and how we needed to put years into that to be able to get to this place to be able to qualify for a home? And, and that was kind of the, the initial birth of HCA. Um, you know, right now we are the largest HUD certified organization in Hawaii. Um, and what that allows us to do is to be able to leverage national resources to go through financial education with Hawaiians here in a way where we can say, we understand that this current system doesn't work, that it wasn't necessarily set up for us, that if you do some of the research um, it's actually set up against us. But here are the, some, of the, some of the tools that we can learn and we can use to try to close on that gap. And um, you know, with, with Jeff's help and, and some of the work that we do in the policy advocacy, we understand that a lot of that has to happen. In addition to that though, we work one-on-one -on -one with financial counselors and our clients um, to go through every single person's personal situation provide them with the tools that they need to know to see how we can try to improve their current, um, their current finances, um, to be able to really focus on how we can change their um, generational poverty 
previously and hopefully move that, move that to a different place in the future. Um, and at the end of the day, the main goal is to try to get them into home ownership. Um, and a lot of conversation now too about not just home ownership, but, but generational wealth, right? Not just stopping there, but understanding that this is the time for buyback. This is a time for us to, to start being um, more, more powerful and active in that area. Um, but we got to start from the beginning and we got to, you know, even just acknowledge the generational trauma that has happened on how we got here to begin with and take those steps um, to try to move people there. So that's a, that's, that's a big part of, of what HCA is, is doing today. Um, the amazing thing about our organization is that many of our staff, a large percentage of our staff are actually clients from before. Um, I, I was one of them. I actually um, was a VISTA volunteer for HCA years ago. And um, during that time became a client and was able to increase my credit score, work on some, some debt consolidation and, and learn a lot of tools that I was, I definitely had no privy to, you know, prior to, to having that experience at that time. Um, and I'm really happy that I did because I went through a lot of, you know, personal experiences following from um, me going through cancer and through my daughter then getting sick with a follow-up of a brain tumor for me. And, um, you know, during that whole time, I, I felt like I did the best that I could in the system that we were given. You know, I, I fought hard to graduate from, from high school. I went through college. I got my master's degree. I um, tried to, to, to follow that scope as closely as everyone said that I needed to do it. And at the end of the day, um, some of those things just didn't pay off when it came to having to choose between sitting at the bedside of my daughter or keeping my jobs. And um, it really was helpful to have some of these tools that HCA gave me at that time to be able to bounce back from that, um, to be able to, to try to keep my head up and say like, okay, this is not going to be a complete disaster that one day I'm going to come back and these are the tools that I'm going to use to redo my credit score, to deal with these medical bills. Um, you know, that, that did eventually lead me to home ownership um, because of it. So um, a lot of us uh, uh, who work at HCA are, are really, really grateful for their services because we've been through it and, and we share that with our clients. Well, hello, Chelsea. I'm really grateful to hear your story and to know your fortitude and grateful that you took your personal experiences and sort of transmuted them and, you know, uh, are now so committed to helping and sharing with others. So uh, grateful for you and, and for the organization. Mahalo. Um, and we have some great uh, questions and, and some have been answered in the Q&A. Keep them coming. I will share the answers after we speak to all of the panelists to ensure that we have time to get to everyone, but um, uh, very um, uh, thoughtful questions. So mahalo. Uh, now we have um, uh, Andrea Freeman. Um, would you please uh, come on and, and give us uh, your thoughts on regenerative economy and uh, how you define it and see it and a little bit of background on you and your work. Yes, mahalo, aloha everybody. I'm so grateful to be here with all these incredible scholars and people working on the ground and everyone who's taken their time to be with us and think through these problems today. My name is Andrea Freeman. I am originally from Toronto, Canada. I now am in Kailua at this very moment. And I am a constitutional law professor at Richardson. I also teach classes in race and law, social justice, and I work on food law and policy from a critical race theory perspective. So my thinking about regenerative economies really goes back to an idea of food sovereignty and all the obstacles that we have to that and the meaning of not just being able to have enough food, but to have culturally appropriate food uh, grown within a food system that is, is a fair labor system and just um, 
encompasses a lot of the ideas that have been put forth already today, Aloha Aina, and the work that people here are doing. Thank you, Andrea. Um, so uh, I would love to ask you a little bit about how food historically has played a role in um, maintaining racism and health disparities in the United States. And, and then also how federal food policy affects our ability to achieve and maintain food sovereignty in Hawaii. Great. Well, it just so happens I'm writing a book on this. So I have some thoughts. Um, and really the, the founding of the United States and before that with um, you know, violent colonialism and, and settlers was founded on the use of food to subordinate and oppress people who were living on the land that these settlers wanted. So uh, George Washington famously put forth a strategy to ruin their crops on the ground, intentionally using starvation to try to force indigenous people from the land, and then later to force political decisions. The, the government would use it to force families to give up their children, to go to, to the federal Indian boarding schools. Uh, food was always used to manipulate and oppress. And similarly, during enslavement, food was used as a tool, uh, whether it was withheld, whether it was given as a reward, again, very specifically and intentionally to try to subdue resistance and try to build the United States into the power that it became. Later, certain foods which were brought over were used as a symbol of citizenship, of identity. And so we see this conflation of whiteness with foods that are unhealthy. And then later, we see corporations get involved partnering with the government to use food, support an agricultural industry that is not geared toward health, but is geared toward corporate profits. And then to target the communities that are most in need and have the, the fewest voices involved in government to, to resist and fight, to dispose of surpluses that are caused by subsidies given to powerful corporations and then taking those surpluses and distributing them through USDA nutrition programs. So to get back to your question about how that affects us, one of the major areas is our schools and our public schools, because they are governed by federal laws and uh, federal lunch programs, which we need to be able to feed the, the school students here, we're not able to take advantage of all of the incredible resources and food that we have here because we are strictly dispersing food that is unhealthy, that is made of agricultural surplus. We have schools that have beautiful gardens and that food can't be given out in the cafeteria because of food safety laws right, which are not actually protecting people, but protecting these corporations. So I hope that helps. Yes, it's very frustrating um, and familiar as a public school educator in New York City, the uh, nutritional quality uh, of, of those lunches was really deplorable. And I know here in Hawaii, uh, working with uh, Kokua Foundation and Ainin Schools and, um, and, and other groups, uh, there have been so many beautiful gardens uh, that we could not take advantage of to boost the nutritional value of lunches. So I, I can affirm um, what you've just said as being uh, true and, and very frustrating. Um, I, I wonder if if um, uh, 
you could answer this question about the Supreme Court and how it has interpreted equal protection to be a prohibition on racial, racial classification, not racial subordination, insisting on um, sort of colorblindness and making it illegal to implement government policies and programs that benefit Kanaka Maoli. Can, can you speak um, to that? Um, I, I need to learn more. Okay, absolutely. And I also worked in the Ain in the Schools program, which is which is such a joy, but also so frustrating, as you said. Uh, so this question of equal protection, it, it's one that I could, you know, do a whole semester on. So I'll try to summarize it really quickly. But when the equal protection clause, which is what is supposed to protect people from racial subordination, racial discrimination was written, it was in response to enslavement, to the end of enslavement, and to the knowledge that states, particularly the southern states, were still not going to treat people who had been freed equally. So it gave power to the federal government to intervene and ensure that, to whatever extent it was willing to do, people would not be re-enslaved people would be treated with equality. So that's the origin of it. It was originally an anti-subordination, anti-oppression amendment, the, the concept of equal protection. But the way that it's evolved over the past uh, 50 or so years is to change. We've forgotten, or at least uh, the court in its majority has forgotten these origins of anti-subordination and come to see the real evil of race in classification. So just the idea of naming races and doing anything in the government name by racial categories has become the evil. So even when a program is designed to uplift a racial group that has been subject to subordination or oppression or uh, you know, any sort of government discrimination, not in the pure sense of the word, but in the, the negative connotation sense of the word. Now, what the court wants to see is colorblindness. So we can no longer use programs like affirmative action in a way that uplifts people who have started without the privileges and advantages that white people have had in this country. This country meaning the United States, not necessarily talking about here, <laughs> but just saying, uh, you know, as far as the US Constitution. So as Ui mentioned in our very opening statement, that really creates a barrier. And the court has directly discussed in Rice v. Cayetano, the definition of Hawaiian and is it a race and finding that it was not allowing, right? Ex exclusive voting for Kanaka Maoli, for OHA and making it just more difficult to achieve sovereignty here. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea. And um, I'd, I'd like to um, now invite um, Edward um, Ed, uh, Quevedo uh, to come and, and share with us. Ed, would you please tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, give us your definition of regenerative economies, your vision? Sure, thank you very much, Maya. And thanks to everyone for their wisdom and their thoughtfulness and uh, to our sponsors. Um, I am a, a diplomat by training, um, having negotiated peace agreements abroad in war regions. I'm a teacher by nature. Um, and in that regard, I'm sort of known for taking my constitutional law students into nature and making them sit on the land to under and understand and appreciate what it is to have a constitution, to be constituted of the land. Um, and uh, I direct an organization called the Foresight Lab which is a culture transformation creative agency working globally to build the regenerative economy, which is an economy of relationships, not transactions, where every relationship generates net measurable gains in ecological, social, and economic well-being, generating net measurable gains simultaneously in ecological, social, and economic well-being. 
because that is the only formula that will reverse the trend towards the extractive colonial economy we have. Uh, my ancestral homelands are the mesas and bosques and dusty lands of the Four Corners region of New Mexico. I'm descended from the Yaqui. Um, and uh, we're currently working to try to build this model of regenerative economics into governance structures. And I'll close my comments on the regenerative economy by talking about the pledge to our keiki, which is very much a part of indigenous Hawaii. Um, and part of that pledge is um, for an island community that defines wealth, not by what is kept, by what, but by what is shared. I will give my respect and leave what is not mine to take. We are spearheading a movement among indigenous communities in Canada, which is the coming to land movement, coming to land, which will replace tourism as a way of taking that idea of measuring wealth, not by what is kept, by what is, but, but by what is shared. Um, and to experience the sacred places of our ancestral mothers and fathers with a bowed head and an open heart. If that finds its way into our organic laws and the social license to operate of corporations is wrestled into compliance with that model, we have an opportunity to create the regenerative economy. Thank you, Ed. Um, I want to ask you because you've spent some time and you've been listening to Hawaii but you've also worked elsewhere but as you look at Hawaii what conditions do you see in Hawaii that make it a propitious venue for the emergence of a regenerative economy or the deepening the the thriving and, and what institutional and policy transformations might be needed to support this sure that's, that's a great question, thank you. And I'll just draw on the, the wisdom of those who come before me this, uh, in this conversation, but, but say that the, the, if I were teaching constitutional law in Hawaii, I would begin with the idea of aina, which is at the center of the Hawaiian constitution. And the provisions that uh, Ui referenced and others make it the organic law of the um, state to respect place and culture. Nature doesn't comprehend physical boundaries and something that is particularly propitious in Hawaii is the natural formation at the local level of the ahapua on the uh, sides of peaks that form the islands. And the fact that each geography is a county make it very practical to build a food and material economy based on place and not on profit. Um, the opportunity to pass laws to support cooperative ownership. We have to go beyond employee uh, and stakeholder ownership to cooperative ownership. It is the business model of the future. We are confronted by an economy that holds revenue and profit, the money side as sacred. That is a phantasm. The whole material economy around us is based on photosynthesis. Everything that nature gifts to us comes from that gentle process of sun and the greenery around us. That can be and should be embedded into how we bank and how we com hold companies accountable to the social license to operate and how we decommoditize land and labor, not buy back land, but hold land as a sacred trust that is shared. And some of our work in building the dignity of owned labor has included in California building an artisanal farm workers cooperative funded by the companies they work for so that people own the dignity of their own labor and don't give up any of that as revenue. It has tripled the income of these artisanal workers and created a dignity and self-determination that is truly indigenous and driving the corporate economy into indigenous spaces, passing laws that require that banking be regenerative and that food economies be localized. These mechanisms are open to us in Hawaii. And I think our opportunity is to imagine an economy that gives back more than it takes and that shepherds us in the, in the whispered spirit of our ancestors to celebrate in the economy, the sacred and the spiritual, the thing that put us here and that will outlive us all. And when we acknowledge that in our day-to-day -day work in the economy, we will have one that is regenerative and all the mechanisms and gears and pulleys, it seems to me, from local county law to the constitution of the state 
create an opportunity for a unique experiment that others can learn from um, and take and use in their place. Thank you so much, Ed. So um, we've had a lot of questions coming in to the Q&A and some have been answered and, uh, or at least partially. And um, uh, I wanted to um, ask, is Kamana here? Is, um, is he still here? Yes, I, I think so. But um, one question here is what has Aina Aloha Economic Futures been doing since the initial brainstorming sessions? And this, um, Sure. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. So um, if you go on our website, you'll see uh, we developed a, we called it a policy playbook um, for the last roughly two to three years of the ledge session. Um, and actually, um, although we're, a part of our effort is really to work in collaboration with existing groups and entities um, to achieve change. So we don't want to claim credit for <laughs> achieving some of these policies, but um, yeah, several of the things that we sort of advocated for in that policy playbook have um, made it through uh, the legislative session and, and hoops. Um, so that's sort of one big lift um, that we've been uh, involved in. Um, additionally, you might have seen, you know, some of the changes that we talked about in terms of actually regenerative tourism, um, you know, are being implemented now in, in small ways and trial ways by the Hawaii Tourism Authority. Um, they really rebranded this effort around Malama and, and are trying to move away from sort of this extractive tourism model. This, these are big ships, um, so they don't turn really quickly, but, um, you know, those are some of the small um, efforts um, that Ainaloha has still been involved in. Um, and right now we're actually in the midst of uh, considering sort of a revision to that policy playbook. Um, and uh, yeah, and so there might be more coming on that. You know, I, I think another big policy win was, you know, the sort of increased funding for um, Department of Hawaiian Homes. And um, you know, that was sort of one of the efforts that we were also kind of trying to uplift. Um, yeah, so great, great question and mahalo. Thank you, Kamana. Um, for Andrea um, and Kamana on food, is the legal framework and structure currently sufficient to have major growth in a native-centered regenerative food economy where uh, we could realistically expect to see it become predominant over the current system? Kamana? <laughs> I, I'll, I can go first, or do you want to take a stab, Andrea? Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, you know, I uh, there's there's a lot of work to be done. I think some of the hopeful pockets to me are around procurement, and at least now there's these efforts to get local cafeterias um, to open up and to buy local food and produce. I think um, one of the the benefits of that for the farmers is you know a guaranteed buyer um, and price point and. I think what we saw in COVID actually is Hawaii grows a lot more food than we had really thought, um, but we had breakdowns in, in the transmission of food and sort of in the delivery systems. When, when the hotels were closed, a lot of food actually went to waste and some of it are sort of niche crops and products. Um, but, um, you know, Ono stuff, microgreens here, here in Waimea, there's a huge microgreens, um, you know, sort of booming um, economy. Um, and so, I think, you know, there's some policies that are hopeful. Um, I, I do think, you know, there's a lot more we need to invest around um, agriculture and really committing to it. And, and you can see the tensions, right, between other land use um, and, you know, lands that we need for agriculture. So um, definitely more work to be done, but those are some of the things I think I would highlight. I'm not sure I have anything to add. I'm, I'm optimistic. And I also think it's necessary, so. Thank you. Well, we appreciate um, uh, that sense of urgency and optimism. Um, okay, so here's um, a question um, about the sort of big drivers of the economy in Hawaii. 
Um, what practical steps have been taken be beyond cosmetic efforts to regenerate the Hawaiian economy vis-a-vis -vis the two single most powerful and destructive industries that continue to hold us economically and environmentally hostage, namely tourism and the military? And this question is for anyone. <laughs> Just um, I, I can I can take a stab. Could you you cut out? My internet is really spotty. My I got dropped earlier. Could you just say it one more time? I, I heard militarism and yeah. mm -hmm. what practical steps have been taken beyond cosmetic efforts to regenerate the Hawaii economy vis-a-vis? -vis, um, uh, well, the question is vis-a-vis -vis the two single most powerful and destructive industries that continue to hold us economically and environmentally hostage, namely tourism and the military. Sure. Yeah, I, I mean, there's a ton of, of tangible things that have been happening for years. Um, again, I think these are big ships. Um, the, the Red Hill um, crisis and, and sort of the rise of the water protectors, I, I think is a really, has been a moment where a lot more people than in the past have really questioned the impacts of militarism. You know, I think really for generations, people have resisted in places like Makua and Pohakaloa and called out depleted uranium. Obviously, Ko'olave was a huge movement for Aloha Aina. Um, so I think you can you can look towards all of those. But I think what's been different with Red Hill is um, somehow why and, and the fact that, you know, people ingested poison water and continue to be harmed. And I think the realization that, you know, we're not a, a place that we can just divert um, the Colorado River and sort of take someone else's water. Um, what we have is, is all that we can utilize. Of course, you know, we might get into efforts for desalinization and stuff, but the aquifer is precious and people realize this. So that movement, I think, has really been broad and has probably allowed people to contest the military and at least think about its impacts um in in ways that haven't happened in the past and then i think i also mentioned you know um in the earlier question around regenerative tourism and i think some of the efforts uh within you know the hawaii tourism authority and the people that are in place trying to change that um are are different than that entity has you know um happened and and been effective in the past here in hawaii so i think those are some of the ones that i'd mention but um you know i really Again, I want to um, highlight like these are very large structures and systems that are incredibly powerful and um, and aren't easy to, to shift and change. Thank you, Kamana. Here's a question related to education. Are there initiatives to introduce the native regenerative economy into Hawaii public school system in a way that is meaningful? If I could comment on a model, um, Maya, I saw that question. I was very intrigued by it. Um, we provide creative advisory to the um, George Lucas Education Foundation, Edutopia. And we're experimenting now with um, primary and secondary school curricula in Canada to bring food science into the science program. This is in connection with a law that we helped to craft and get passed in British Columbia to require that 100% of all food served in schools within that province come from within 50 miles of the school. This has been a huge boon to the cooperative food uh, and local food economy and to a seasonal food economy in Canada where we don't import strawberries in the summertime and where we grow within the constraints of nature, the food that was meant to be grown and driving food science and understanding that, you know, in the survey done by Edutopia at the beginning, 80% of kindergartners think food comes from the grocery store. So putting food science at the heart of education in the primary and secondary school environment so that there's an arc of learning such that um, the student who comes out of high school understands the science behind food and soil and the need to both regenerate soil because the United Nations Agriculture Agency says that we have 50 harvests left on the planet because of the collapse of soil health. Soil health can be regenerated through carbon banking. We solve climate, we solve local food and education through that model. And I'd be happy to 
to answer further questions about this offline. But this model will work in British Columbia and it can work elsewhere because it brings the child into relationship with soil and land and food in a way that hasn't been done and isn't mandated by any curriculum now. Mahalo. And I want to just say that Hawaii certainly does have, I mean, we have Na Hopena Ao, uh, Hopena Ao um, with the Hawaii DOE. It's like a department wide framework to sort of develop certain skills, behaviors, and dispositions that reverence Kanaka culture. Um, it's imperfectly and um, unevenly implemented, but we have, of course, a lot here of place-based, culturally responsive education taking place in the lo'ikalo, in the fish ponds, in the honu ponds, in the you know farm around um, various um, cultural uh, sites. Um, uh, and there are economic implications there, um, and in the efforts to think about circular economy. Um, I, I know that school children have been brought in uh, to think about kind of social entrepreneurial um, efforts, but um, I wonder if anyone else has some thoughts about education. Yeah, could I, could I take a stab, Maya? I, I just want to add some local context and, and you're absolutely right. I think the Aina-based education, you know, cultural-based education movement has been a real leader. Um, in really uplifting our ancestral values that um, really guide how I think we would see a regenerative economy take place here in Hawaii. Um, and Ui and, and Derek sort of explained some of that earlier. But you know, there's a plethora of sites. I mean, Ma'o Farms, again, Waipa Foundation, Pai Pai Ohe Iwa, um, Kako Iwi, um, the Molokai Fish Pond Cruise. I mean, there's so much education that's happening around food and sovereignty and, and regenerative systems. So again, I think that was some of our effort for Aina Aloha was really to uplift this incredible community innovation. Um, and then, you know, in regard to circular economies, we had a resolution um, to create a task force. We almost made it, we made it through the Senate and died in the last committee in the house. But I was amazed by how many students, young <laughs> people found out about Aina Aloha economic futures and circular economies and were writing about you know, all support to have this thing passed. Um, so there, there is an incredible drive from the student level, but um, we need help, you know, with education administration across the DOE system and would love to talk story and network with anyone that um, wants to uplift that. Thank you, yeah. It is true that people do get it, you know, the circular economy and, you know, they uh, just in terms of thinking about uh, waste and thinking about shared spaces and, and um, used um, goods and, you know, they, um, they are quite remarkable and, and make me feel uplifted. Um, uh, there's um, one more question here. Um, I Maya. Um... Can I just like just briefly add, um, in addition to what uh, Dr. Beamer shared, uh, you know, I think it's very important to support those organizations and those entities and kind of building off a little bit of what Edward commented on, uh, you know, for those of you who, for those of us who want to better support or find ways to better support regenerative economies. Um, and I think, you know, Edward kind of mentioned uh, just very briefly, uh, you know, co-ops. We do have a natural foods co-op here on Oahu uh, in Mo'ili'ili known uh, uh, called Kokua Market. It's been here for 40 years and for those 40 years uh, or over the course of those 40 years, they've made really strong efforts to support our farmers and even like super small scale farmers who might not necessarily um, send their produce to market. Uh, I was previously a lot more uh, active with them before I was gone for about five years, but they've also, in addition to kind of op in addition to operating as a co-op, uh, one of their goals was in the past to develop a a nonprofit to kind of do some of those things, reach out to the schools, and better educate uh, the younger generations about the sources of our food and connect our communities with our actual food producers, uh, both here on Oahu and on the neighbor islands. Thank you so much, Derek, for that example. And I was a co-op member uh, for a time. 
Um, so we have uh, just one uh, final time for one final question before we hear from uh, Kumu Ramsey Tom. Uh, so I I um, I'm sorry if we did not get to your question, but uh, by all means, you know we will uh, hope to have additional conversations uh, that kind of deepen and and. Um, extend our understanding and, and we hope this is just a, a, a really solid beginning um, for this particular group of people to, to think about shared endeavor. But this final question is just um, to vision the regenerative future we know is possible. Um, maybe uh, one panelist can jump in and say, what is the positive tipping point, uh, the rate of adoption you'd hope to see as we collectively move in this direction? So if someone who has a vision of like, what, what do we want to see um, as um, sort of proof that um, a truly regenerative uh, economy is possible. Well, I, I think in terms of a tipping point, Maya, um, I think we're already there. Um, and, and it's difficult to see locally and globally, but you know, globally you have entire regions adopting this model. Amsterdam, for instance, which is a was a very high level extractive tourist kind of destination prior to COVID has adopted sort of Kate Rayworth's model of donut economics. Um, um, recently, um, a province in Ireland um, has, has adopted it. And so I think we're seeing individual like municipal places, Maui, Maui is making big moves on circular economy with their um, county councils. And um, I should also say, you know, Hawaii County Council adopted Aina Aloha, um, so did Maui. Um, Oahu worked with Zero Waste Oahu, so there's a lot of traction. Um, and I think as, as we see it become more mainstream in the legislative session um, and with um, businesses, you know, I think that'll be really a major tipping point, but uh, I feel like we're there. No, that's good news, Kamana. Thank you to all of our panelists. Um, thank you to the law school, to uh, the professors, administrators, students there uh, for this collaborative effort. Thank you to Jose from the Matsunaga Institute for helping to put this together. Thank you to Robert Perkinson of the Better Tomorrow Speaker Series for helping to uh, facilitate uh, production of today's event. Uh, and yeah, just mahalo to all of you who are doing the work on the ground, um, lifting up good examples and supporting with your decisions as a consumer, um, as a um, community member. Yeah, I think that there is a great deal about which we can feel proud here in Hawaii and um, there's so much uh, about which to feel excited and uh, determined with regards to um, the generation and growth of uh, regenerative economies. So uh, uh, thank you for, um, for your presence, your participation. And I'd now like to invite uh, Ramsey Tom to come uh, take us out with some uh, final thoughts and um, important uh, considerations and and words of hope. Yeah. Well, first of all, mahalo, Maya, and to what a wonderfully rich panel. I'm not sure that I can do it justice with a quick summary of what everyone had to say because I think it was every piece of it is an ingredient to a recipe for success. Uh, when we put it all together properly. And I think so many people talked about how the relationship to our place, to one another, to the Aina, all of those things are critical. I was particularly uh, pleased with uh, and happy to hear what Ed had to say about that whole relational piece as well. What, what is intriguing is that this definition of reimagining suggesting that we've done it before, right? and that we can do this again. 
but it's not about going back anywhere. As everyone has suggested here, that there are principles and concepts of our kupuna, of this place, that to a certain degree was already a successful model. And I'm not sure that we can go back anywhere, but we certainly can bring those things forward. In the conversation I heard today, a lot of the things we're talking about has to do with mechanics. And yet we're talking about meaning, definitions, redefine, reframe, and refocus. And I think we're in that point, as Kamana said, we've kind of reached that point where people recognize the need to shift and are making those shifts. I like to suggest that one of the biggest shifts that is part of this concept of the economies is just a, the name itself, the word itself, the mechanics, where we're engaged in a system of accounting. Well, much of what we talked about is rooted in a concept of accountability, that we have reverence for our place, for our relationship to food and one another, and just don't refer to them. It's just not a reference, but a reverence. That the difference between accounting and accountability this notion of malama to aloha, the reciprocity. To a certain degree, we were already living in a regenerative economy. One of our challenges, of course, is the very term itself. The regenerative economy still borrows from a definition that looks at our resources, and our Native Americans who call them relatives, as a capital asset. I'd like to suggest that what I was hearing here was the opportunity for us to actually begin to acknowledge the inherent right of nature itself to being able to exist as we have in our own culture recognize a relationship between halo, the vai, the kai, the air, the land, all of those things. Right now, the current economic system does not necessarily recognize the rights of nature to have its inherent right to be healthy, whether it's the water or the land, the sky or the sea. And so I think what I'm hearing and what I've heard today was that we have the opportunity. We're moving towards that. But it does require us to perhaps redefine and reestablish some of these principles and maybe even the priorities and bring them forward and rethink as well as react, redo uh, the way that we connected to our places before and to one another. I'm particularly struck by the definition, the original definition or one of the original definitions of e economics, oikonomos, the Greek concept that it was really about family. It was really about relationship to place. And interestingly enough, that's what we're talking about. It's exactly what Arkupuna were doing here in Hawaii. That there was a relationship to the place and to the food, where it came from, and who were, who were we actually feeding. This concept that is about feeding forward. We lead to feed and feed to lead. Today's conversation was very nutritious. I hope those that were listening in are coming away with that nutrition and not just a caloric exchange, but a true nutritional one. And I thank you for the opportunity to participate, to listen in. And like I said, I'm not sure that I can add to what others have said, but just to acknowledge that one, we have a great opportunity and now is the time for us to do this. I wanna thank each of the panelists for a very, very rich afternoon. Mahalo. Thank you everyone for this time of, of conversation, consideration, reflection, and healing. And we'll see you next time. Happy Constitution Day and Day of Peace and Justice. Aloha.